As a journalist, I've been covering the United Conservative Party ever since it was elected in 2019 and then re-elected in 2023 with Premier Danielle Smith at the helm. There have been alarm bells ringing for a while and political scientists in, uh, around Alberta have been raising concerns about drifting towards authoritarianism. This is a line that comes from Professor Jared Wesley at the University of Alberta. I want to talk about the, what the current UCP government looks like and where it might be going. And is it or is it not authoritarian? Might be something else. But I'm going to be talking to Professor Dwayne Bratt from the Mount Royal University. He's a political scientist there. So welcome to the interview, Dwayne. Hey, Mark. I'm happy to be here. Well, good to have you back. Uh, my uh, my readers and listeners, uh, viewers, always appreciate your comments on Alberta politics. Uh, give me your take on the broad question of how do what pigeonholes should we put Danielle Smith and the United Conservative Party into? Okay, so uh, I would highlight the excellent column that, that Jared Wesley wrote on his uh, Substack, where he goes through a series of criteria and, and measures that, um, not just with the Smith government, with the Kenny government. I would make distinctions. I, I think what Kenny did um, was typical government stuff. Uh, I think what we're seeing with Smith is, is categorically different. Um, and I think Jared makes a good point that we're not talking about democracy versus authoritarianism, that there is a continuum. And I think we're both on this continuum. I think he's much further to the authoritarian side that, than I am. I think the potential is there. I think what we're seeing, though, is a centralization of authority, a centralization of, of power. And I can describe where I, I see that occurring. Uh, and I, you would please give us some examples. So examples of that, I think, are um, around the cities. Um, premiers and big city mayors have always fought, not just in Alberta, but every other province. Um, and there's all sorts of squabbling about this. Uh, but I think what Smith is doing is trying to kneecap municipalities. Uh, by saying they can't go to the federal government for, for money, um, that the, uh, the provincial government will have the ability of disallowing municipal bylaws, disallowing municipal elected councillors uh, as well. Um, we already have a, a Municipal Governance Act that puts a lot of constraints on cities, uh, they can't run a deficit. They can really only rely on, on property taxes. And even with property taxes, the provincial government takes a portion of that. We're seeing in Edmonton, we're starting under the Notley government, but actually ex uh, uh, fast tracking through Kenny and got worse with Smith, where they're not paying their proper property taxes. Now, they don't Provincial governments don't pay property taxes. Federal governments don't pay property taxes. But what they do provide is grants in lieu of property tax, right? So you can't tax another government. But what the, the previous provincial governments have always done is provide a grant in lieu of what it would be worth. The federal government does the same thing. Notley reduced that grant. Kenny reduced it even more. Smith has reduced it even more. This obviously has a bigger impact in Edmonton because there's so many more provincial buildings in there. So those would all be examples of weakening uh, the big cities. And, and that's really where it's being targeted at, not municipalities writ large, but Calgary and, and Edmonton, because Smith, like Kenny before her, like Ralph Klein, like lots of other premiers believe that the voters of Edmonton and Calgary uh, keep voting the wrong people in that they keep electing progressive councils. Um, you've got to go back to the 1970s, for example, to find a conservative mayor of Calgary. I think there's been one conservative mayor in Edmonton since that time. There's usually a minority of conservative leaning councillors in, in both jurisdictions, and they blame it on a lack of a party system, that if only we had parties, more conservatives would get elected. So. These are a series of ways that they're trying to diminish potential counterweights 
to the provincial government, obviously trying to diminish the power of the federal government uh, in the provincial sphere, but also school boards, universities, et cetera. Uh, any area that seems to be in conflict with the provincial government, the province is taking steps at eroding their authority and their, their power. That's what I mean by centralization of authority. Let's have a, let's talk a little bit about uh, where this stands in the Constitution, because uh, there are only two levels of government recognized in the Constitution of Canada, yep. is the federal government and the provincial government. Municipalities within Alberta, I think it's the Alberta Governance, Government Act, Alberta Governance Act, something like that. Uh, how, do, how have governments in the past interpreted uh, the fact that the, the municipalities are the, the creatures of the province? That they... Yeah, and they and they are. Uh, so this is I'm not making a constitutional argument. Everything that I have described, they have the constitutional authority to do. And this has been proven by court case after court case after court case dealing with these disputes. So, for example, I'll use some Ontario examples. Um, they amalgamated the city of Toronto. Uh, they brought North York and Etobicoke and East York all into one mega city. Uh, and there was people upset with that and said the provincial government can't do that. They took them to court and the court said, no, they, they can do whatever they want. Doug Ford, the day that nominations closed for the municipal elections in 2018, reduced the number of wards in the city unilaterally. Um, and the court said, yeah, you, you, you can do that. So they have the constitutional authority. I'm not making that argument. What I'm saying is what they're doing is um, counter to democracy uh, the idea that you have local authorities because they're closer to the to the people that there are differences between Tabor and Calgary or Three Hills and, and Edmonton and that's why we have local government to be able to administer that and that makes total sense eroding that power of local government as the government is doing in bills 18 and 20 I think is is anti-democratic. And I can just imagine if an NDP government had taken the same action, conservatives would be pulling their hair out. In fact, subsidiarity is a conservative principle, right? That you have authority closest to the, the people. So on the fiscal session, we often get this argument that the federal government has the money, the province has the jurisdiction, but it's the municipalities that has the boots on the ground and, and has the best understanding of their local local environment. That, okay, so um, Jared, Professor Jared Wesley is, is arguing that this uh, political designation is, is on a continuum. He thinks that the Alberta uh, and the Smith government are drifting towards authoritarianism. You are a little more hesitant to, to do that. What would be your threshold for the Smith government uh, moving from what you have called in, in previous interviews with me, radical, uh, sorry, uh, libertarian populism uh, and moving into what would be, you would recognize as authoritarianism. So, so a couple of things, and I, and I will speak about this a bit later. She is shifting from libertarianism um, to centralization. Those are cross purposes. Um, and, uh, so there's that piece where I would say is the two big hammers that are sitting in Bill 20, and that's the disallowance of municipal bylaws. And this is the disqualification of elected councillors. I don't necessarily have a problem with the disqualification of councillors. I had been arguing for a while that Calgary councillor Sean Chu should have been or should have been removed. I recognize they didn't have the authority to do that. I was hoping that he would be shamed enough to, to resign. He has not. If this gives the provincial government the ability of removing him, so much the better. And the reason I'm picking on Sean Chu for, for listeners outside of Calgary, outside of Alberta, is stories broke just as people the weekend before people went to the polls in 2021. So advanced voting had already occurred. This occurred on the Saturday and the Sunday, and then the election is on the Monday about his behavior as a Calgary police officer. 
and uh, serious allegations, including some punishments by city police for his behavior around sexual assault of a minor, including in a police uniform. And uh, we saw that in the voting where he gets defeated badly on the votes on Monday. But because of the votes that occurred in the advance polls before these stories broke, um, he ends up winning. Um, his behavior since then hasn't been that much better. Um, he's been uh, up on ethics charges for taking photographs of Mayor Gondek's license plate and circulating them on social media. If they use this power to remove a guy like Sean Chu, I think that is appropriate, that this should be about personal defects that are so egregious they need to be removed. In party systems at the federal and provincial level, parties have other mechanisms to deal with that. Booting them out of caucus, not signing their nomination papers, removing them from committees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Municipalities don't have that. And that's why I think this is important. If, on the other hand, they use this power to disqualify someone who's who did an action that they just politically disagree with, uh, then I think that's at the authoritarian realm. I will go even further. There's one insidious little thing in this. So what I've just described is what is called Clause A about the disqualification of a candidate, of, a, of an elected official. But they could go to clause B, which is to create an automatic recall vote, okay? An up or down, yes or no, to remove this person. And that I call quasi-democratic. The government may use this to be able to say, see, we're, we're listening to the people, we'll just have another vote. But in municipal elections, because they're multi-individuals, Rarely does anyone win with more than 50%. So I would put the case to you that Mayor Gondak, the day after she was elected, had there been a recall vote like this, would have lost simply because, you know, while she got 40% of the vote, that meant that 60% didn't, didn't like her. So those, those would be the areas I would be worried about. Or Calgary is going through this massive public hearings around rezoning, what is called blanket rezoning. So it's not being done neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, and they're going to make a decision on this and they're going to have a vote on this. If after they go through all of that process, the provincial government steps in and says, no, you guys made the wrong choice. Uh, you, you shouldn't have done those public hearings or you did. You just didn't listen to the right people. We know who those right people are we're going to disqualify that bylaw, then I think we're drifting onto that authoritarian side. And the example that Rick McIver, the municipal affairs minister, has given is a bit worrisome because he keeps flagging Edmonton's COVID mask bylaw that they had to get the legislature to uh, vote and remove. Uh, this wouldn't, what I just described wouldn't involve the legislature. It could simply be an order in council from the cabinet. And the reason I say that's problematic is when COVID began, the provincial government was split. The province was split. You had big cities where the local population wanted stronger health restrictions, and a lot of rural communities didn't. The, the provincial government didn't want to touch this with a 10-foot pole, so they simply said to the uh, municipalities, you do it, right? And so Calgary and Edmonton and Lethbridge did one thing, Olds and Brooks did something completely different. And then after allowing that, they, they cracked down and says, nope, thou shall not, and this is what we're, we're going to do. So that's not a very good example that McIver is, is saying, because the provincial government was encouraging municipalities to do this before they cut them off at the knees. Dwayne, Alberta has had some fairly colorful gov provincial governments in the past. Yeah. And Ralph Klein comes to mind. Uh, there have been some prior to 1971 in the election of the progressive conservatives. There were some very conservative governments uh, in, in power. Uh, is this just another example of colorful 
Alberta politics, the kind of, you know, that you don't see in, in other provinces of Canada? Um, this qualitative no, I, I think this is qualitatively different, but let, let's talk about this, this populism uh, streak. Um, I think Ralph Klein was a, a traditional populist. Yes, he tried to externalize the opponent. I think he rarely mentioned opposition parties. Um, where he focused was Ottawa, and he, he focused the attention there. So in other words, he was saying, you know, we're all in this together to fight Ottawa. Daniel Smith is doing the same thing, but she doesn't have the same popularity, seat count, vote count that, that Klein did. She is facing a significant opposition. The closest election Alberta ever had was in May of 2023. Where I think her actions are going, and she's not there yet, um, but the possibility of there is Bill Eberhardt in the 1930s. So Bill Eberhardt was a populist. He had his radio show. It was in the Great Depression. You know, he created an us versus them. You know, um, he was going to go after, you know, Eastern bankers, but the 50 big shots and all of that. You know, he was a man of the people. And then when he took power, he started to systematically go after counterweights, uh, whether that was the lieutenant governor, whether that was the press. Um, and that's where, so Smith isn't going after the press, Smith is going after cities and also after universities and other agents of, of the legislature um, in a way similar, not quite as bad yet as, as what Eberhardt did. And this tendency of populists to then centralize once they get authority Right. So a populist is we're the people we represent the people, the common sense of the common people. But then they after they win, they internalize it as if only I can represent the people. And we see this with uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary. We see this with Donald Trump in the United States. Uh, we saw that with with Bill Eberhardt in Alberta. And we're potentially seeing that in, in Alberta with Smith. What about Smith's ability as a communicator? Because one of the things that's fascinating to me, you and I have both known uh, uh, Premier Smith for a long time. Yeah. And uh, you've been interviewed by her. I've been on both sides of that uh, table with her. And it's, I would say that in the last year in particular, uh, her ability to communicate pretty unusual ideas and proposals in a way that's very comforting and and she can sell it the most outrageous things uh that maybe others couldn't and what role might her ability as a communicator play in this drift towards authoritarianism that albertans otherwise might might be worried about well and that's the other thing about populist leaders is their ability to communicate uh, so I talked about, you know, uh, back to the Bible hour and Bill Eberhardt using radio, and he was an electrifying uh, personal speaker. Um, say what you want about Donald Trump, those rallies, you know, he knows how to, to communicate to a certain group of, of people. Um, so that is one of the gifts that a successful populist leader has is those communication abilities. And, and we've seen that with, with Smith. I think she's gotten more discipline uh, in her messaging than when she was first um, elected. Um, the, but there's still, uh, I think her debate performance in, in the May election was, was critical. Um, so she, she still has that skill set. But I'm watching this now. And Jared Wesley calls it cheap talk about just throwing these ideas out there and sometimes following up, sometimes not. Um, my friend Janet Brown, the pollster, refers to it as chaos theory, that it's tough to focus on an issue because every other day there was another issue. So last week it was Bill 20. And then uh, Monday it was rail lines, you know, uh, provincial trains, you know, to Banff and high speed from Calgary to Edmonton. It was going to be a 
multi-billion dollar project over 15 years. And then yesterday it was cutting transit for low income uh, people in Calgary and Edmonton. And today it was the reversal of that. So it's tough to focus on any one issue because you keep changing the channel, which is like a radio show. Monday we do this, and Tuesday we do this, and Wednesday we do this. At a certain point, this is going to lose its effectiveness. I think her biggest ally, unwittingly, is, is Justin Trudeau. And there are a lot of people who say it doesn't matter what she does. I just can't keep track of what she's doing. But she's fighting for us against Trudeau. Therefore, it's all justifiable. And, the, and they see the fight with the cities. It's not really a fight with the cities, but as a fight with, with Trudeau. So does this shtick get old over time? Can you continue to have this chaos theory? It's worked pretty good for, for a year and a half uh, or two years. Um, and, and what happens when Trudeau is gone? We'll wrap up the interview this way, Dwayne. Um, it appears at this point in the NDP leadership race that Nahed Nenshi, the former Calgary mayor, appears to be to be leading. And so yeah. let's assume for a moment that he does win. And now he's got two or three years where he's the opposition leader. And is his form, I mean, I, I don't know if you call him populist, but he's certainly got charm and charisma and celebrity and other yeah. things that that would seem to counter Smith. What role might he play in where she goes next uh, if he becomes the leader? Yeah, I, and I do believe he will he will become a leader, uh, the leader, and that will be a fascinating thing to, to watch because it's not just that he's got the, the policy background and it's not just his, his communication skills, but also the personal history that he's had with Smith going back over 30 years. Um, and so right now, we're kind of in a phony war between them. Um, let's see what transpires once he once he comes in, because um, Notley underperformed, I think, against Smith. Um, they ran a very effective campaign against her, um, highlighting all of the errors and mistakes and worrisome things about about Smith, and that's why it was a close election. But they didn't give enough reason for people to, to vote for, for Notley. And and Notley had a great debate performance against Jim Prentice in 2015. It was one of the reasons she won and didn't have a very good performance against Smith. That's one of the reasons she lost. So she was a bit up and down on that. We'll have to see how, uh, how Nenshi handles this. Well, I have to say there's no end of interesting things happening in Alberta politics, and that is a consistent theme that runs through every year, it appears. Uh, Dwayne, uh, pleasure as always. Thank you very much for this. Okay. You're welcome, Michael.